it's only 30 minutes, I'm not going to talk about myself first. So if you want to know about me, you just put my name in Google, or I'm called the Naked Anthropologist, you can put that in Google, and you'll come to my website. And there are lots of things about me, but more importantly about, I blog regularly on these topics, and I, um, and I have all my, that I had academic stuff for a while, I did that for a couple of years, I have all those publications so that you can find everything. There are resources and you can contact me if you want to. But otherwise, since it's a half hour, I would just like the chance to actually talk about sex work as work without arguing about the meaning of prostitution. Um, the first thing that I usually talk about, it'll all be very brief, so these are like thinking points, talking points that later you can ask more about or look up. The first um, problem about talking about sex work as work is the, what you can think of as the problem of sex. That a lot of people think that the topic of sex is, should be sacred or romantic. Um, that it's, sex is something that's supposed to happen only with real meaning between people who really care about each other and some people think that they should produce children um, and that it should, there should be a certain kind of authentic, authentic emotion involved. And then there are the people, then there's the, others, the other way to look at it, people that don't necessarily think of it that way or sometimes sex is meaningful and romantic and full of authentic feeling and sometimes it's just fun or uh, something you have to do to use up time or whatever. Um, it's something opportunistic, you didn't plan to do it. Um, you have friends with benefits, so that's what you do with them. Um, it can also, this kind of sex can also be anonymous, public, dogging, and commercial. Now what I usually say to people who are very anxious about which of these is the correct way to feel is that I think of it like a religious question. I think that if you believe that sex should always be sacred and romantic and not wasted in these other kinds of ways, and you find commercial sex horrifying, then you personally should stay very far away from it. But it turns out that many people don't feel that way about it. It's kind of a God question. So that they don't feel that way about it, they feel that they can have different kinds of sex with the person they love and the person that they don't love. Um, so the, anthropologically, you can think of this, or like a human nature, is that the meaning of the sexual act is not always the same. That seems very obvious. But when you talk about prostitution, it seems to be that we all know what we're talking about, but we don't. The meaning of what the sex means at a different point with a different person is different all the time. Um, sometimes sex feels like labor, even with someone you love. Sometimes you're not really keen on it, and you have sex with the person anyway because they want it, and because because that's how things work, because that's how the marriage works or the relationship. Um, and sex can be thought of as labor also when you are trying to produce a baby, for instance, and you're really working at it, and maybe even you're getting IVF or something. Um, but So the question is then what makes something really be work? Why, when people talk about this, why is there so much confusion about it. Um, so one way that you know whether something is work is if the government says it is. Some governments keep a list of official occupations that people can have in the country so that when you fill in a form, you tick, I am a train driver, I am a school teacher. Um, so that it seems significant sometimes that there's nowhere to tick to be a sex worker, or a prostitute, or escort, or lap dancer. That's one way that it can be work. Um, another possibility is if a judge says so. So for instance, in Spain, there have been many cases where for one reason or another, the, the people who worked in a sex club, a brothel kind of club place, 
uh, ended up in a court where they, were, they had been treated unfairly somehow by the boss and where the judge said, I don't care that these are illegal migrants. I don't care that uh, there's no name for this escort girl in the list, to the registration list. They obviously work for you, so you have to pay Social Security for that. You have to, you have to do that. So those are cases that happen, and that happens fairly regularly. Um, and then another possibility is when the sex industry, when businesses, sex businesses themselves, are regulated in some way. So, for instance, uh, you, you are supposed to register as an independent escort, or um, in the England and Wales, there's a, there's a Sexual Offences Act, and there's a Sex Businesses Act, and it tells you, if you have a strip club, how the strip club has to be run. You have to have a certain number of security guards. If the dancer comes out into the audience, then a meter has to be kept between the dancer and the customer. There cannot be any touching. These are a list of rules that you can laugh about, but in fact, they are typical, ordinary, the kind of rules that any other business has. Um, now, so that's when you think of it as sex entertainment. The ex an example, a well-known example, where there's regulation that seems to be working fairly well is New Zealand, which has rules like, okay, we're going to license brothels, but if you are up to four people working together in a flat, you don't have to get a brothel license. So that means that you are legal if you're being a sex worker or an escort in your flat and you're allowed to have people around you. Um, if you are a brothel, then you have to register with the state and comply with all the rules. So when I talk about the sex industry, another reason not to, not to get bogged down into the prostitution debate is that the sex industry, commercial sex of all kinds, is really a very wide, includes dozens of different jobs. Yes, so for instance, uh, I mentioned the independent escort. So now think about such a long list. So then there's the escorts that work with agencies. There are people who take sex phone calls. And that's all they do. They're either in a call center or they're at home, but they're answering the phone. So they personally are not having sex. The person on the other end of the line is. Um, there's strippers and lap dancers and other kinds of dancers. The people who dance or show off in peep shows. There still are peep shows in a lot of places. I don't know if you have them here. Um, there are a lot of people working at home now in front of a web camera. So again, there's sex taking place and maybe both people feel like it's sex, but they're not in the same room together. So you can see why it's problematic to always talk about prostitution. Because what happens is people will say, well, that's not, this one is, but that's not. That one's naughty, but it's not really as bad as this other one. Um, then there's people who sell sex in the street. This is what people ordinarily think of when people talk about prostitution. They think about those girls in short skirts and red stockings in the street. Um, that's a very, very small, diminishing portion of the whole industry now. We, there's no way to have real, uh, real numbers because this all isn't regulated, but that's what the TV cameras and the policymakers worry about because those people are so public. So there's street workers, there's people who work in massage parlors, and I won't go on. The point is that you can't generalize about sex work, look at that, what are you going to do? Sex work is the following, no. Because which one of those jobs are you talking about? Um, and a lot of those people don't wish to be called a sex worker. Sex worker is a term that's used by activists who prefer the, a lot of them prefer the title of sex worker to prostitute. However, there are sex workers who prefer to call themselves prostitutes because they wish to say that this is an old profession and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, 
I'm just going to jump over the whole idea about whether people are choosing to do this, whether this is about free will. I consider these jobs to be like all other jobs according to the opportunities you have at the moment and the luck you have in the job market and the people that you know who help you get in contact with people. You may find out about a webcam job or find out about a peep show job and so you're not choosing, you're not sitting and saying which of all these things. You're trying to get something arranged for now. Um, and a lot of it is occasional, so you need a little extra money, so you, it's the end of the month, and so you know you can go do phone sex for a week and be able to pay the rent or something like that. So these are not, a lot of people are not having a strong professional sense. In the sex worker rights movement, you do meet people who have strong professional feelings about what they're doing. Um, that's, they're an important group, and I support them. But my work was about migrants originally, and it certainly wasn't about people planning their lives. A lot of it is opportunistic. Um, so then the idea of problems related to work. So the kinds of problems that I know about, because I've been in this sex industry world for 20 years and listening to people's stories and going to their events. And um, the problems don't have anything, they're not about clients. So this whole story that you're told about, it's all about the exchange between the, the, the escort or the street worker and the client and whether this person is violent or not. No, it is not what people talk about. Most people are not violent. Most people anywhere are not violent. Um, so examples of the kinds of real problems that people have. For instance, in New York, trans, um, trans street workers are picked up by the police. If they have too many, what's considered too many condoms with them, they can be arrested for prostitution. So that's considered a big work problem that if you, you want, you need to, have the, need to have the condoms to do the work, but you can't be caught with them by the police, therefore you're endangering your health. That's a work-related problem because you can count on the police to take advantage of you. Um, in Mexico, for instance, uh, a lot of bar girls, so that means you go into a bar and you hang out and you pick up people. You have to drink a lot. So a lot of people complain that this work environment forces them to drink too much alcohol. In some places, uh, clubs, people have, the client has to buy a bottle of champagne and expects you to uh, share it. This is a hostess job all over the world and people have too much to drink. That's a work-related problem. Um, in London, which has uh, many thousands of escorts and people who work in flats. The problem is that the law does not allow you to work with someone. So this means that you are very exposed. This is a counterintuitive idea. You would be safer if you could have another escort there with you or the classic maid in the, in the walk-ups in Soho. But those people are being accused of trafficking or being a pimp or exploiting so that the work-related problem is I'm forced to live alone and also that's very antisocial. People, all people do not wish to work alone. Um, in, the, in the Thai, in, in Thailand, uh, sex workers are very organized in a lot of places and they've now said that they've, uh, They've solved all of their problems, all the problems that they used to have. They've worked it all out with the police and with the clubs and all of that. But the problem now is that everyone wants to come and rescue them. But this is what my work has been about. But now they have to deal with all these people coming in and saying, you don't really want to do this, we have to take you out of here. That's what they've identified in their annual report as their biggest work-related problem. And in terms of strippers and dancers, I suppose there must be some in this room, um, the biggest problem is that you have to pay now to work. You actually have to pay a stage fee in most places now, most countries. 
to be allowed to get up on the stage and pole dance or lap dance in corners or whatever in order to make money. Now that's very unusual. How many, how many jobs are there where you have to pay the boss in order to be allowed? Those are the problems, plus police harassment. It's not about the individual moment between the client and the sex worker. It's about the, the social context for all this unregulated stuff. Um, so that's why what I wish that we would do is talk about this as a labor sector. What would happen if we talked about sex work and the sex industry as a sector of labor in the economy? You can think of it as a service sector, like being an air hostess or a therapist or a call center person. In this case, you can think of it as emotional labor, uh, where you follow a script and you try to please the customer, and there's a kind of um, traditional back and forth about it. And another alternative for a lot of the jobs is to call them entertainment. A lot of people feel that that's what they're doing. And in the entertainment paradigm, then it's a performance. Just like me here, it's a performance in which you are trying to reach certain people with a certain kind of message. You may wear a uniform to do it. You are probably pretending to like or be interested in people that aren't really interesting, but that that's part of the job. And as you all know, that's part of a lot of jobs. This isn't unusual. Um, so sometimes this gets called the sex sector, which was also the name of the book. Um, it's a structural approach to looking at sex workers' work. Um, it's how governments see businesses. So the way governments do their accounting, governments have something called accounting, where they decide which businesses, which professions are going to be recognized as belonging to the formal economy. And those will be registered with the state and those workplaces will be regulated in some way so that you, they pay a fee to get the license, they have to get the liquor license, they have to get the sex license, they have to um, provide toilets for the workers, they have, the workers have the right to object to things, um, there are inspections by people from the state, this is normalization of um, the workplace. That's what the formal sector is, and that's where you find workers' rights, because it means that if you go to the boss and say, I I don't want that schedule you're fining me for coming late, it's not fair. You have some kind of redress. There are some kind of rules. There is someone to talk to. Um, and the opposite, the other side of this, is the informal economy, which is everything else. Everything else, um, and everything else is more or less disqualified from being counted. However, in some countries, like India, the informal sector is far bigger than the formal sector. In Brazil, the informal sector is amazingly huge. So everything you do in, as a favor for someone, all of the drug dealing, all of the pickpockets, all of the sex work, all of the businesses, if the DIY, the paying to barter with your neighbor in order to get the some work done in your house, all of those things that you ordinarily in your life do informally without it being registered with the state are called the informal sector. And in the informal sector, all bets are off. Workers have no rights. So everything depends on your relationship with your boss whether you can manipulate or make nice with your boss so that you can make things work out for you. So this is where exploitation takes place. And this is where, if you see my book, Sex at the Margins, which was about migrants who are smuggled into countries, 
and then sell sex, most of the time nothing bad happens. But the situation is all both the travel and the work are completely unregulated. And therefore, of course, you have opportunities for bad things to happen. It doesn't usually happen. But that's where the opportunities are. And as long as this is all considered informal, then workers can't do anything except try to leave a job that they find unbearable and go try another one. Uh, in 1998, the International Labor Organization published a research report based on years of very good, real, grounded research quantitative research in four Asian countries on the sex sector. That's the name of the book, The Sex Sector. And they found these are all four countries where a lot of sex businesses are regulated so that they could see what, how many people were doing what and what problems there had been and what kind of yeah, uh, suits had been filed and who was uh, doing what. And they also were able to compare with some, some things that they knew about what was happening in the informal sector. And they first they found, and so this is also, there's no emphasis here on the personal relationship between the prostitute and the client. This, is, this will go nowhere. This is about the businesses in general. Um, so what they found was that, first of all, in some of these countries, huge huge pieces of the economy go into sex businesses. And there are interesting reasons for that that have to do with war and exploitation, but that have resulted in places like Thailand having an enormous sex industry where many, many people work. And what they found was that fully one third of all the people uh, working we're not selling sex. So that means that all of the, the waiters and barmen and people doing laundry and people selling clothes and security guards and drivers, all of those people made up fully one third of all the employees with all their families, all of their dependents and families depending on that as well. But these are businesses that are integrated into the economy and the ILO concluded that the only way to make things safer and more just for the people selling sex and all the other people working in unregulated businesses was to regulate all of the businesses, was to make everything, put everything into government accounting, make it part of the formal sector so that there could eventually, over time, be controls for what's going on, and businesses wouldn't be in limbo, and taxes would be paid, and workers would have agency to object to things that are wrong. Now, people usually want to know, uh, <coughs> but what about trade union, and what about organizing? Well, I have to say that the most successful of the of the organizations that exist are not technically trade unions. Um, the DMSC has 60,000 members in India. 60,000 prostitute sex workers of all castes, but many of them are the, considered to be the lowest caste. So that they actually, they negotiate with the government and they try to control the red light districts and they and they have had quite a bit of success. 60,000, of course, India is huge. So, but that seems enormous to a place like Europe, where everything is very small. Um, there is also, there are examples like Amar in Argentina, where the, technically the group belongs to a union. So there's a national union that has allowed them to be inside but actually doesn't do much about it. The, the, the women are on their own trying to still fight about stigma and uh, the usual problems, what the law is going to say, how the police act, violence from police, etc. So it's not that it doesn't work at all, but the um, examples in Europe, for instance, are, um, they are failures. 
they are failures. They have tried in Germany, um, they've tried in Germany, Holland, uh, England and Wales, and somewhere else, in and Spain a couple of times. So what, what it means, it's not like the union has decided. There's been someone, some management level union officer who has said, pardon, who has said, we'll let you have a, a branch here, and then nothing much happens, is what it is. The unions don't know how to do this organizing, but the real question is, if these businesses are not regulated, how? How can you negotiate for better conditions? It's almost impossible. Um, a lot of workers themselves see no, they're not activists, they see no benefit in coming out and being public. The stigma about being a sex worker is not much better than the stigma of being a prostitute. People don't understand. They become disqualified from the conversation. So most people just want to get on with doing their work and avoid problems. Um, people who have uh, jobs may not want to register because they like the aspect of the informal economy in which when you don't like it anymore, you can just slip away. You don't even have to give notice. You can just slip away and go do something else or go for a holiday. Um, now, in Europe also, half of the people who do this work, at least half of the people, are migrants. They're undocumented. Enormous numbers of them are undocumented. So that means you have no right to work at anything. You have no work permit to do anything, much less work in <laughs> an unregulated <coughs> sector. So that also makes things incredibly difficult in this Europe of tightening borders and miserable Frontex and all of that stuff. Um, the other kinds of organizing that happen have been much more kind of successful, which has to do with movement building amongst uh, people who sell sex. So there's a network of, uh, an international network of sex work projects. They negotiate with UN AIDS. Getting in by the health uh, door is, has been obviously the way for a lot of people to be able to be listened to somewhat. So in Australia, the Scarlet Alliance is a member <coughs> of the prevention of AIDS organizations in the, in the country. Um, <coughs> Right now, I'll end with a kind of a negative thing, but it's interesting. There's a, something called the Sex Worker Open University, which has only been around for a couple of years, which does sort of organizes a week of events in which some academics come, but it's largely people giving workshops on different things. They had everything set up in Glasgow this year. The Scottish TUC had agreed to let them have one of the um, events in their hall, and they pulled out at the last minute. After the, all the brochures had been sent out, all of the stuff had gone out, they pulled out and said, you can't have it anymore. Now, why is that? That's because some, some feminist idea inside the women's sector of the Scottish TUC got really angry. And this is also what has stopped a lot of the stuff that's happened in other countries. So they managed, they, they managed to get press releases out and to find another place to do it, but this is the kind of reason why I said originally that I wanted to be able to have this half hour of talking about this without bogging down inside the old, very old, repetitive prostitution debate. Thank you.